Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Are you enjoying the conference? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, so my name is Jan Willem Tilp. Just a moment for that now. Um, and I thought instead of um, just uh, uh, telling what, what I do, I thought maybe it's a nice idea if, uh, um, if I try to find out what people think that I do. Uh, so I went to my Twitter account and uh, quite, I've quite a following uh, by now and pe quite a few people have added me to a list and these lists are in, uh, named list, and so I extracted um, some of the words people have been using to name their list, and then I just looked at the, the frequency of those words, and um, I'm very happy to announce that one third of the, the words that have been used in, in those lists is data visualization, which is actually what I do. Uh, some other words that are related uh, to what I do is data, of data science sometimes, design, infographics, data-driven journalism. Um, and I, I can hear you thinking, why is this guy on stage? Because we, this is a Python conference. Um, but in 0.4 percent, <laughs> people have also added me to a list where Python was in the name. Uh, <laughs> that, so I have a reason to be here, I think. Um, but actually, I use Python for all of my projects. I, uh, I use it to prepare my data sets before I actually create a visualization. So I'm actually a Python user, but I don't tweet a lot about it, so that probably explains it. But... So let's get started. So first, um, let's just take the time and think about the word archive and come up with some associations, let emotions flow. What, you, what kind of feelings do you have by the word archive? Good ones? Something? Anyone? I'm sorry? Old and dusty, Old and dusty. yeah. I think that's uh, probably one of the most common things where people, th what people think of. You also have your email archive, which is also a kind of place where you put your emails where you don't, when you don't want to read them anymore, but you store them just in case. Um, but yeah, there are also these physical archives, and I think most people think, well, these are kind of old, dusty uh, locations where people store books and it's, not, it's may, maybe a little bit cold because of the, the temperature control, so not the most funny place to be, probably. But that's not true for every archive. And I want to talk about one archive in particular, which is the State Archive for Dutch Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, and this is quite a, um, an interesting archive because it uh, contains about 150 years of Dutch architecture. And in, this archive is maintained by uh, a museum called the New Institute in Rotterdam. And it's actually not an archive, it's a collection of archives because uh, when uh, an architecture or an architect, uh, architect organization decides, well, we have an archive and we want people, we want to have it maintained and they transfer it to, uh, uh, to the new institute. And last year, um, the Dutch national government also assigned the status of national heritage to, to this archive. So it really is an important and valuable archive, uh, which is, is kind of a small piece of the collective memory of, uh, of the Dutch. Um, in, inside this archive, there are a lot of photographs, uh, sketches, uh, models, books, uh, reports, uh, all kinds of documents. So it's really a big archive. It's the biggest architecture archive in the Netherlands and even one of the biggest in the world. And uh, the new institute has put quite a bit of effort in making the archive accessible online. So you can go to their website and then you, uh, you will visit this page, you will en end up in this page and you can enter a search uh, word, a keyword uh, at the top of your, uh, of, of your screen and then all the archives that match your uh, keyword will, will show up in the result list and on the left you see some facets. Well, it's a very common way of searching and then if you click on one of the archives you get a detailed page uh, specifically for the archive and there are all the documents that you can, well some of them you can look at because they have some scans, other ones you can, uh, well at least you can make a reservation so that you can go to the archive and have a look at it. Um, and this way of searching is really common. Um, this is a Dutch 
uh, house search website and on the right is a car searching website, uh, Auto Scout. Um, and you, basically you do the same thing. You say, uh, you know what you're looking for, this is, uh, I, can ha I can pay this, this amount of mortgage, um, I'm looking for a house with three rooms and um, what are the results? And then you, you narrow down uh, the search base. And same goes for a car, I want a diesel car, it should be a station uh, from this year and you also narrow down this uh, search base. And it's a very effective way of, of um, searching through a large collection of data, but there's one big assumption here, and that is that you know what you're looking for. And that's not always the case. Um, my wife and I are, are almost in the stages for looking for a new house because our house is becoming a little bit too small. Um, but one of the things that I'm personally interested in is the house that I have in mind. What are the chances that I find it in the location where I would like to live? Should I look somewhere else or should I look for a different type of house or something like that? And same goes for a car. If, if How unique is my search? Uh, what are some alternatives that are easier to find? Those kind of questions and also the, the more general sense of what does a data set look like, it, that's really hard to do with, with a search interface like this. And one of the ways that you can uh, access data and search through data and get a better sense of the overall uh, contents of a data set is by using data visualization. And when I think of data visualization, I think of something like this. When you look at this picture, you see a lot of people walking. Um, there's a lot of things going on. And um, if you would want to make sense of it, it's a little bit difficult. Um, but there's a Dutch photographer, and this photographer uh, travels the world, and he, he goes to cities, and there he takes pictures of people, and he publishes them on his website and his books, but he does it like this. And I think this is really amazing, because um, he groups them by the way people dress, and suddenly people start to become part of a group that they were not aware of. And this is exactly the same thing what a data visualization designer does. You look at a data set and you try to come up with a design that shows some structure and uh, some, some outliers and, and uh, allows you to see some patterns in the data set. Now, every data visualization <coughs> can, uh, contains three components. Uh, and you might, you might label them with three questions. What, why, and how. And the what is the data that you're looking at, um, what is represented, the why is, why is a user using a data visualization, what should he get out of it, what are the questions that he should answer with the visualization, and uh, the how is the visual design and the interactions. And these are also the areas where it can go wrong. If you have the wrong data set, then your visualization is wrong. If you ask the wrong questions, it's not right. And also, if you have the right questions, the right data, but you're not showing it correctly, it also goes wrong. And these are also the areas where you can improve things. If you improve the quality of your data, if you ask better questions, or, or if you make a better design, then your visualization will improve. So this is part of every visualization. So let's talk about the concept for um, the architecture archive. Um, <clears throat> the new institute approached me and asked me well, we have this big archive and we would like to know what does it look like? That was their question. And it is actually a very good question to start a data visualization process because um, when, you th when you start a data visualiz visualization process, sometimes people think that, oh, well, you just think of a design and then you build it or design it and implement it and that's it. But that's not the case. You, sometimes I describe what I do as finding a visual representation of a data set that works for a particular situation. You always have to discover what works and what doesn't work. So this question is really good because it gives you a direction, but at the same time it doesn't tell me what it should look like. But at the same time it was still a little bit too abstract for me. Um, so I came up with two sub-questions and one is, what does the contents of the archive look like? And more specifically, are there archives that are um, similar if you look at their contents? And the other one is, uh, what does the structure of the archive look like? Um, now let's look at, have a look at the data of the architecture archive. Uh, if you look at the website, this is a, a detailed page of one of the archives. Then there are several components that are already visible that are, can be used as a data set. 
Um, first, there's a, a title. It has an identifier a title, and then after the slash, you see uh, the type of archive. Then there's some other metadata. Um, for instance, the period the archive is about, or the size, and just for your information, the physical size of the archive, there are, there are archives that are over 250 meters long, so that's really a big archive. Um, and then this was really the part that was most interesting to me because this is a tree structure similar to the folders and files on your hard disk. And also all these, all these elements in these tree structures had labels. And that's what I could use for um, understanding the contents of, of the archive. Now, this is a Dutch sentence, but um, this is an example of, the, uh, of a title that, that was there. And what I wanted to do is was extract some, some kind of informative words. So I did some uh, natural language processing uh, on this data. And I wanted to extract the nouns and the verbs and the morphology, so the combination of words. I wanted to extract them, uh, get rid of punctuation, get rid of numbers, and things like that. Um, here's another one. I also wanted to. Um, know if something was a person, like Kromhout is a person, Middle on Cezé, that's Mediterranean, so that's, uh, that's a location. And so these are all the kind of things that I wanted to extract so that I could get a better sense of what is this archive about. Um, only a week and a half before I uh, had to deliver the project, I came across this one. Um, I've been using uh, a Python, Python package called Pattern, which you may know for language processing. Uh, but the thing is that many of these language processing uh, uh, tools are very good at English, uh, and sometimes they also support other languages, and they are reasonably supported. So Pattern worked really OK. Uh, but I had to do a lot of work in order to make it right. And then I came across this. And this was developed by uh, two Dutch universities specifically for Dutch. So this worked extremely well. The only thing is that um, the original language you are processing, if that's not really good gr grammatical Dutch, then the result is also not very good. And that was also quite often the case, because those titles were just descriptions, and sometimes it was just cover one, cover two, cover three. So that doesn't really tell you something. So there was still a bit of a challenge. Um, so for the visual design, I would like to give a live demo of the result. And I cannot see my s screen, so I have to uh, switch to mirroring. Oh, that's already the case. OK. So this is the, um, the end result. This, this is the first part. This is the content of the archive. And what you see right here is uh, these are the archives. And they are clustered by uh, similarity based on their contents. And they're also colored and positioned uh, based on that. If you hover over an archive, you can see the name of the archive on top. And below that, you see the three most frequent words. Um, on the left and on the right, you see two lists of words. And um, those morphologies I mentioned, the combination of words, that's what I'm showing here. Because I was interested in, uh, there's, for instance, the word building occurred many times. But there's a hotel building. There's a Congress building, there's all kinds of buildings. So I wanted to uh, get a better sense of all those types of buildings. So on the left, you see a list of words that, uh, parts of words where that's, uh, are the beginnings of bigger words. And on the right, you see parts of words that are the endings of bigger words. So here you see, um, for instance, uh, yeah, it's all in, in, in Dutch. Uh, but for instance, uh, project. So you have project documentation or project correspondence or something like that. So and if you click on it, you can see where in which um, archives these words occur. And the same goes for, uh, for the ones where the words are ending on um, uh, a part of a word. And then you can see where it occurs. The other part of the visualization was about the, uh, uh, the structure of the archives. And once you click on a visualization, you can see what the structure of the visualization looks like. And this is one of the visualizations. And over here, you see it's actually a, um, just a line chart where you can select different archives. And it's based on the number of nodes in the network. So here are the bigger archives. And personally, I think this is very interesting because this is some kind of signature image 
of each archive. Each archive has its own unique appearance. So let me switch back to my slides. Now, as, as I mentioned briefly, um, um, I, w when I start a visualization project, I need to get a sense of a, of a data set. So I usually try to visualize data really soon in the process. And here are some sketches of, of the visualization that I did just to get a sense of is this big data set, is there a lot of variety, and things like that, and what works visually. Because I also have in the back of my mind the idea that I need to communicate it and I, it needs to look nice. So it's not just about what's, what's correct or, or something like that or most effective, but what, what's also nice to look at. So here are some different ways to look at maybe the same archive, but using different algorithms to, to show a network. And it was just, yeah, trying out what works, uh, what doesn't work, what looks nice. Um, so these could all be the same archive, but looking completely different. And this one, for example, I thought th this is not really working. You see one archive which has a lot of nodes at one level deep, but um, there's a small <laughs> exception there. Uh, and so I thought this, this was not the, the best solution. So, well, you saw what the end result was. But also the clustering was a kind of exploratory process because there are so many parameters you can play with, uh, the strength of, of the attraction and the repulsion of the nodes in the network, uh, the size of the nodes. So here everything is shown at once. Here's one big cluster on the right. Here's uh, um, only a cluster in the center and the ones on, on the outside are not connected, uh, which is also not very good. Uh, here everything is one big blob in, in the center, but also the styling. How do you sh show the different uh, nodes? Do you just use transparency? Um, should I show the links between the nodes so that you better see the connections? Uh, maybe a combination. Um, what if I show just the, uh, uh, or, or reduce, have a fixed radius for every, uh, every circle? Uh, and also, the, the, the natural language process uh, provided me with lists of verbs, nouns, adjectives, and things like that, and also persons and locations. So one of the ideas that I had was maybe I should offer the user an option to, to dynamically cluster the network based on nouns or adjectives or something like that. And this one, for instance, is based on persons, and it, it actually shows that a person is very much related to one archive and not to other archive, which makes sense. An archive is about one architect or archi architecture organization. Um, so, and even those connections may be coincidence because maybe two people have the same name, so it's not even the same person. So I decided not to do this uh, in the end. And this is just, these are just a few examples and also the highlight color what uh, should it be white or does that work i also had the idea of, of showing the um uh, the most frequent word per cluster but i decided not to because it to me it was a kind of too much of a reduction to a single word where there was really a lot of variety in the uh, in the words that were used in the archives so i decided not to do this and also the line chart you saw at the bottom of the uh, of the uh, um, of the rotating networks. This was, was another example, and I was looking for a visual representation of, of that where it didn't interfere with the rotating network and, um, and didn't take up too much space because the rotating network was uh, the main point of that view. So, so it's really a lot of experimenting and trying things out and, and see what works and what doesn't work. So <clears throat> what makes a data visualization interesting? Now, there are um, researchers in social science that are trying to figure this out, what makes something interesting. And um, there are at least two challenges. Uh, people differ in what they may find interesting, and what's interesting now may not be interesting in the future. But these researchers do some experiments, and I would like to try this experiment with you. Um, I've done it a few times in the past, and most of the time it's, it's successful, but sometimes it's not. So don't feel guilty if, if the experiment fails. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a visualization, and what I want you to do is to rate this visualization on a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being 
not interesting at all and 10 extremely interesting for whatever reason and that's just it so just give a number how interesting do you think this is well you, you don't have to you don't have to mention it it's, it's just for yourself I think everybody has a number. Um, okay, let me explain a little bit about this visualization. This is a visualization done by Boris Mueller, and he's a professor of information visualization at the University of Potsdam in Germany. And he created this visualization. And it is part of a, a festival called Poetry on the Road. Um, for several years, he has been asked to create a, a visualization based on the actual poems of the festival and uh, this visualization was used on the poster that was uh, well, uh, used to announce the, the festival. And what you see right here is that every circle, every big circle, is one poem. And the bigger the circle, the longer the poem. Um, and then he came up with an idea where you assign a number to a letter. So A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, etc. And then for every word, he summed up those numbers. And well, each circle is actually a scale with 0 on the top. And then uh, based on the sum of, of these uh, numbers, um, the words, the red dots, are representations of words. So they are putting on a radial scale. And then the sizes of the red circles are bigger if more words have the same number. And then the, the gray lines are used to connect the uh, poem in the original order, uh, or the words in the original order of the poem. So now that you know a little bit more about the how you could read this visualization, who made it, what it was used for. Um, how would you rate the visualization now? For who did it go up? Quite a few. For who did it go down? Also quite a few. <laughs> for who did it stay the same? Oh, that's also quite a few. I, I, couldn't, I really couldn't tell if there's a majority or not. The idea is that um, uh, interestingness, according to the researchers, has two main components. The first one is novelty, which is what we usually think of when something is interesting, uh, because it's surprising, it's new, it's uh, uh, unexpected. But there's another component to it which is just as important, which is comprehensibility. So you have to understand what you're looking at. Um, if you put this in a, some kind of diagram, you can think of it like this. Um, if something is very common and it's comprehensible, then it's a little bit boring. You can think of bar charts, for instance. They're very effective. Everybody understands them. They're used all the time. But at the same time, they're also a little bit boring. Um, if something is incomprehensible but also uh, novel, maybe the visualization I just showed, showed you, it can be very beautiful, but you can think, what am I looking at? It looks nice, but I don't know what it is. Um, if it's common and if, if it's incomprehensible, then it's a failure. And you can think of those as uh, visualizations, for instance, a pie chart where the segments don't add up to 100%. That's kind of manipulating. Um, and well, if it's comprehensible and novel, then it should be interesting. So let me tell you about another project I did. Um, and um, this is a project I did for the European Space Agency. And it's about this satellite. And this satellite is called Hipparchos. And Hipparchos is a satellite that was in space uh, a few years ago. Um, I don't know if it still is, but at least the, a few years ago, it made measurements about stars. And uh, all the data collected um, was ended up in a, in a large catalog that is both available digitally and uh, well, in printed format where you have several volumes with lots of tables and, and diagrams. And it was, at that time, the largest star catalog of the world. Um, and inside this catalog, you can see diagrams like this, where you can see locations of stars, um, brightness of stars, whether stars are moving or not, and things like that, or the direction they're moving, because they're all moving. Um, and when the European Space Agency approached me, they wanted to, they asked me if I could create a visualization that communicated what, what is a star catalog, what's in it. Because the European Space Agency is an international government funded organization and one of their, uh, one of the things that they also do is, is communicate to the outside world what they're doing. So they have a, a group of people that work with education, uh, um, 
so to, to explain to students what, what they're doing and uh, a large communication uh, uh, part in their organization. And they also did a little bit of research what was already out there with regards to interactive visualization of star catalogs. And there wasn't very much at the time. So there was one, if you look for instance on Google for stellar motion, you don't find a lot of results. And also on YouTube, you find a few animations, and this is one of them where you see one constellation and it moves uh, over a 100,000 year period and then it changes shape. And that's, but that's about it. So I thought there was uh, quite a bit of an opportunity there to create an interactive visualization. So let me again give you a demo. So this is the starting screen of the uh, star catalog visualization. <coughs> and what you see here on screen is um, on the right, you always have a short explanation of what you're actually looking at. Um, here on top, you see some small suggestions uh, from how you could interact with the visualization. Here on the lower left, you have uh, buttons, uh, buttons to turn on star names or constellations. And here at the bottom of the screen, you have a few sections where, where I will go through that, it, that shows you several aspects of star catalog. And each of those views has uh, a small um, control to interact with the visualization. And this particular view is about the apparent magnitude, and that's the brightness of a star as you would see them from Earth. And with this slider, you can change the brightness of the star. So these are all the stars that the, uh, uh, that the uh, uh, satellite measured. And you can also move around in space, and you can zoom in and zoom out. And personally, I think it's quite interesting to see when you turn on the constellation that, especially when you zoom out, you see that they, the choice of stars of a constellation was really a human choice in a, in a specific moment in time where it made sense to, uh, based on what they saw from Earth, but not, not necessarily from the distance from Earth. So another view is the uh, absolute magnitude, and that's the brightness of the stars as if they are from the, a fixed distance from Earth. And here you can switch between them, and you can see that they become, most of them become bigger and brighter, some of them become smaller, and. Um, but what I'm actually doing is uh, when you zoom out, you can, see, you can see the result. I'm actually placing all the stars at a fixed location. So that's how the brightness of the star changes, or well, in order to uh, explain the concept of the uh, absolute magnitude. Now there's another uh, diagram which is often used by astronomers, and it's the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And, um, on the y-axis you see the absolute magnitude and on the x-axis you see the temperature. And you can here switch between white and color and color is based on the temperature. And for astronomers this, this diagram is interesting because it, the location of a star in this diagram tells you something about the life cycle of a star. <clears throat> the next view is about stellar motion and then what I've done here is I've created a stereographic projection. So when you zoom in here, you can see it especially if I turn on the constellations. In the previous one, you saw that the constellations were distorting and here they just become bigger and smaller. So here again, you can zoom in, move around. But here you can simulate how stars would uh, move over time. So you can move forward and backwards in time. And I don't know if I have a good example right here, but well, yeah, over here you see it, for instance. This is what's quite interesting, that some stars move in, in clusters. So that's uh, quite interesting to, uh, to notice. And finally, there's a, a view where you can play with all the controls at once. So you can turn on more stars, you can make them colored, you can set the, the turn on the motion, and you can switch between 3D and um, the stereographic projection. Oh, there's a nice cluster. So this is the uh, star mapper for the European Space Agency. 
Now, the reason why I showed you this is, is because um, uh, yeah, maybe uh, someone is thirsty, I don't know. But uh, uh, the reason is, uh, this is uh, an example of storytelling with data. And storytelling with data is a little bit different than literary storytelling, where you usually have a main character that goes through an adventure, and um, it, that's, it's really a chronological sequence of events. But with data, that's not really the case. With data, you tell a story and you use data to support your story. And um, uh, researchers have looked at a lot of visualization and discovered that several models have been used over and over again and, if, and three of them are very popular and this is one of them and this is called the martini glass model and it's called this way because um, well martini glass is narrow first and then it widens up and that's exactly the way the, inf the visualization is structured. First I showed a very limited views. You had only one option uh, to interact with the visualization. Uh, it was only about one topic. So it's really focused and then you move on to the next which is the same. So you're in the narrow part of the martini glass and then in the final view it opens up and then you can play with all everything all at once. And the reason why you want to do that is because if, if you want to explain something to a user using a visualization you, and it's a little bit more complex, you usually don't want to throw the visualization at him and for him to figure it out himself. You want to guide the user through the process a little bit and, uh, and explain to him what he should look at. So at the end, when he can play with everything at once, he should know, okay, this is what I'm looking at and this is what, what's happening right now. <clears throat> Another way um, to, uh, um, to create interesting or engaging visualization is this project. Does anyone have an idea how many trees there are in the world? The total number of trees? Five? Five? <laughs> Almost. Anyone? <laughs> well, let me reveal the result. It's 3.04 trillion trees. Um, <laughs> If you would chop down one tree every second, it would take you about 100,000 years to chop down every tree. So it's still a big number, but maybe a little bit more understandable than a really big number. Um, this was the topic of a research that has been done um, and was published in Nature magazine. And uh, the researchers, before the study, the researchers only used satellite images to, to make an estimate of the total number of trees in the world. But for this research, they did something different. For this research, they also dispatched people, so, uh, and they, they had those people count trees. So whenever they looked at a satellite image, they were much more certain that this was an accurate estimate of this number of trees. Um, and Nature magazine uh, was publishing this research and they wanted uh, an animation for this, uh, to, to showcase this research. And they approached me and asked me if I could do that using a visualization. And let me show you the animation. Do I have sound? How many trees are there in a forest? What about a country? How about in the whole world? The answer we now know is that our planet is home to 3.04 trillion trees. That's actually almost eight times more than we thought, as previous estimates were only based on satellite pictures. But now, we have data not just on how much land is covered in forests, but how dense those forests are as well. Measurements were collected by thousands of people out counting trees in forests all over the world. The average density of trees at each location is represented by the height of the green lines. Some of the densest areas are these subarctic forests, where you can find a tree every square meter. But almost half of all our trees are found growing in the vast tropical and subtropical forests. All this data is going to help our understanding of where endangered species might be able to live, how water is cycled in the ecosystem, or how much carbon dioxide is being absorbed from the atmosphere. It also helps us work out what we ought to be doing to preserve and replenish our planet's forests. Because even accounting for new growth, we're currently losing about 10 million trees a year. At the moment, there are about 400 trees for every person on Earth. But they're disappearing at a rate of 1.4 trees per person every single year. If we keep going at this rate, a walk in the woods will soon become a lot trickier. Thousands of years ago, before human civilization,
civilization took hold, the earth had almost twice as many trees as it does now. Most of Europe, for example, was one big forest. Groups all over the world are working on planting trees and restoring natural habitats. This new data will make their targets more accurate. And it will certainly change our fundamental understanding of our planet that we now know we share with 3.04 trillion So for this project, I uh, received a data set, and you're looking at it right now. Uh, it was an image, um, <clears throat> but it was a kind of special image because this was uh, one gigabyte in size. And uh, the reason is that you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in until you, until you end up with one pixel, which is one square kilometer. So the researchers have been able to uh, <clears throat> Um, to, to create an, uh, a map of the Earth with a resolution of one square kilometer, and for each square kilometer they were able to estimate the density of trees, which is really amazing. Um, when I created this visualization, I was looking for a kind of view like this. When I think of trees, I, I thought maybe I want something like this. So it's green, but it's also a little bit bumpy. Um, and that's what I had in mind when I wanted to create this visualization. So I started out first, I had the, all the coordinates mixed up, so, but then I ended up with the original idea that I had in mind, which was also a failure because um, what I had in mind was just show only the trees on the globe, but a transparent globe and displace the dots based on the density. But as you can see, this image totally doesn't make sense. Um, so, yeah, I quickly moved on to uh, a solid globe and, and to bars to show the, uh, the density of the trees. But to get the bumpy appearance right was quite tricky to do. As you can see in this image and in the next one, the, the, the green is really yeah, just one big area of green and, and it doesn't look like the bumpy appearance I was looking at. And so I've tried all kinds of different things, different colors, different types of representing the bars, but all didn't produce the right result, you still see the one big area of green and not the bumpiness. And then finally, I figured out what did work. So in the end, every bar is, is, has a gradient. It starts out with the color of the globe, so kind of bluish, and then ends up with the green color that I assigned to, uh, to, to uh, the bar. And this way, they have different heights, and then you have different colors on different heights because of the gradient. And this way, you do see the, the bumpy image, and it works really well. And um, it also ended up on the, the cover of the magazine, which is really nice, of course. Now, the reason why I'm showing this project is because um, what I've done here is I've been using uh, metaphors. And in, in this case, the project was about trees, so I thought, what what are some characteristics of trees that I could use? Well, obviously it's green, the bumpiness, and that is something in general which you could uh, think of when you create a visualization. Think of the, the actual characteristics of the data that you're visualizing. What are, what's the meaning? Can I use some of those properties in my design? And I have some examples of other people's work where this is done as well. This, for instance, is a visualization done by the South China Morning Post, and it's about the deaths in Iraq. And basically, it's just a bar chart, but since they flipped uh, the y-axis and made the, the bars red, it, it clearly has the appearance of blood. So they, this is a good example of using a metaphor and, and, and thinking about what does the data represent and what does it mean. Here's another one. Uh, this is a wind visualization. It's an animation, if you go online, uh, by uh, Martin Wattenberg and Fernando Viegas. And, um, well, the common weather maps usually have arrows, uh, but this one is actually, especially if you go onto the online version, you see flows of, of lines going, and they become narrower and wider, and, and that's much more in the way we experience wind than an arrow. So the final project I would like to show you is this. Um, for visualization, I strongly believe, I think just as with uh, writing code in general, 
you only get very good at it if you practice. Um, you can read a lot about it, but if you don't do the actual coding or creating visualizations in this case, you don't, it's hard to become really good at it. So um, I, I really like doing personal projects as well, and this is one of those projects. And this is about the Dutch national elections of 2012. And um, when the elections were over, people had a few questions. Uh, which party has won? Which party has lost? What are possible coalitions, which, are, which is also always the case in the Netherlands? How is my city voted? And these are all very good questions, of course, because that's what the elections are about. But you can also ask different kinds of questions. Um, <clears throat> the question I personally had was, which cities vote in a similar way as my city? And maybe are there some patterns in the data? Um, well, the concept is more or less something like this. So if you take these voting results, um, you just overlay them, and then you look at the differences and you sum them up. And well, you can imagine if it's zero, then they're exactly the same. And if it's not, then they have some difference. More or less like this. So this is the visualization that I created. You see a map of the Netherlands. Uh, I actually didn't draw a map but because the Netherlands is really densely populated. So you can see the shape of the Netherlands just with the cities. And you can hover over, or you can click on cities, and when you click on it, they become bigger and more orange. And other cities also become bigger and more orange if they are more similar based on their voting results. Um, on the top left corner, you see a bar chart with the voting results of the city that you've selected. And this is another layout, where you, a radial layout, where the selected city is in the center of the, of the screen, and the more similar uh, the voting results are the uh, the closer to the center the other cities are. Um, I also included another data set about uh, population size because uh, I thought maybe there's a correlation between bigger cities and smaller cities. Um, so that's what I also included. And it turned out there were actually some interesting findings. Um, the first one is, is something like this, which you can find in several places of this map. And it's... These are regional clusters. So this is around the city of Eindhoven, which is a relatively large city. And funnily enough, Eindhoven is, itself is not in this cluster. So it's really the cities around Eindhoven that vote in a similar way, but also a little bit different than the rest of the Netherlands. But I think this is quite interesting. And, and also, if you would extend this project, would these kind of clusters remain the same over time? It would be qu quite interesting to research. Um, another thing is, um, in the Netherlands, we have a Bible Belt, so if I select one city of the Bible Belt, you clearly see that they all vote in a similar kind of way. Um, here I've selected Bosnaar, which is a city associated with richer people, and then the other ones are also cities of where people think rich people live. So that's also something uh, that you can see in the data. Um, in this view, I've selected Amsterdam, and um, although the relationship is not that strong, you do see that the bigger cities are more on the inside than on the outside. So bigger cities also vote a little bit in a similar way. And as with many data sets, there's also, uh, there are also outliers. And this is Urk, and uh, there, there's no city that votes like Urk. <laughs> so, uh, now, I've, I've received emails uh, that people were using this on, for half an hour uh, during work time, just playing with this visualization. And I thought, why were they doing this? Because, well, and I, I recently discovered this book. It's called The Hook Model, uh, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And it's, it's basically about what you do when you want to create something like Facebook so that people keep using it. And inside this book, they have this model. And I think this model also applies to the visualization. Because first, you need to have a trigger. And if you move over with your mouse over the visualization, you see that it turns into a hand. So you are triggered that you can click on it. And then clicking on it is the actual action. But what's key here, I think, is the variable reward. So sometimes you see something, sometimes you don't. And you also have to do some effort for it. So I think. Um, that's one of the main reasons why people were really playing with this visualization for quite some time. Um, because, yeah, sometimes you can really find something and sometimes you don't. And also, uh, something like the Bible Belt that I discovered, the visualization itself doesn't tell you there is a Bible Belt in the visualization. I just 
thought of, the, thought of it myself, and then I confirmed it with the visualization. But you can do that yourself as well. So you can think of, well, maybe I know where farmers live or something like that, and see if there's a pattern there. So you can find things yourself. And I think that's uh, something that, if you can apply that to your visualization, that's uh, something that's really useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this inspiring uh, talk. I think the image of thousands of people uh, counting trees all over the world will stay in my mind uh, <laughs> for a while. And also amazing how you can get from uh, like one white and black uh, picture to a representation which contains much more uh, detail. So we have maybe time for just one quick question. Yeah, here. So hi, uh, do you use off-the-shelf tools and libraries or do you build stuff yourself to do these kinds of visualizations? It's all uh, custom visualizations. The only thing that I do use is uh, some frameworks. So one of the most popular ones is uh, D3. Um, but for the, uh, uh, the European Space Agency, for instance, I use 3JS. So I use libraries like that, but other than that, it's, uh, it's all custom. Okay, maybe one other quick question. If there is any here, just close to the microphone. So... Uh Similar question, but if you deploy these projects, what's your typical technology stack? The typical te technologies that I use? Yes. Um, I would say that today most of my visualizations are web-based. Um, and for the data preparation and wrangling and, and everything on that, I, I use Python. And those are basically the, the, the tool or the, the programming languages that I use. I sometimes use Tableau, which is a business intelligence tool, but um, it, it allows you to quickly get a sense of data because you can just open an Excel file or CSV file and then drag and drop and you, it already creates diagrams. So sometimes I use that, but most of, today I most of the time use Python for that. So but mostly Python and web-based frameworks, whatever. Okay, so thank you very much. Now there's a coffee break. Let's thank Jan Mullen again. Thank you.